Hi, everybody. My name is Diane Stahlschmidt, a very grateful member of Al Anon. <sighs> Gotta compose myself here. Okay. Oh. I'm so happy to be here to share my story with you. And uh, Geneva told me during lunchtime to try to spice things up. <laughs> I don't know how much I'll spice it up, but my lunch was spicy. <laughs> when I first came to Al-Anon, I really didn't even know what Al-Anon was. Um, I knew what AA was, but I never heard of Al-Anon. When um, I was raised, it seems like all of our speakers were raised Baptists, and I was raised Southern Baptist also. <laughs> um, I had a very good child life, uh, very loving parents, the oldest of three children. I, have I had two brothers. And everything was just, you know, very good. It was a great life. Um, I was a, a goody two-shoe, as some people would call that. I was not a risk taker at all. And uh, I can remember the, oh, I think it was 14 or 15, my next door neighbor, Mary, uh, we wanted to go to uh, a putt-putt miniature golf course. And it was about, I think, a half a mile from our house. So I got permission from my mom, you know, can we go over there? And she's like, sure. So we walk over there, and we go to the... Uh, the stand where you have to pay and that. And here's this tall, skinny guy with a big blonde afro, mm -hmm. kind of strange looking. And uh, my neighbor introduced me to him, and that was my soon to be, in the future, to be my husband, Rodney. And so we played putt putt. And then as we were Going back home, we had to go up this hill. So here we are, Mary and I are walking up the hill. And then my husband gets on the PA, and he says, Goodbye, Diane. <laughs> and I'm just like, oh my gosh. You know. So that started our relationship. <laughs> we went to separate high schools, and it probably was a good thing because uh, after a while, when I kind of got to know him and found out that he was in sports and he was really good at it, uh, so he was kind of popular. And, you know, at my school, I was in the marching band, and that's probably about the biggest thing that I did. And I, you know, studied hard, and that's how I was. Well, we always got together on during the summertime. And my mom preached to me, there's plenty of fish in the sea, go on lots of dates. So that's what I did. When I went out on a date, it was just to have fun. So whenever Rodney and I would get together, we'd go play tennis, go to the movies, or just ride around. It was just to have fun. And then when school started, we didn't see each other. Didn't even talk on the phone. Uh, I think in our either junior or senior year. There was one year where I went to his prom and then another year then he went to my prom. And that we really didn't get into a serious relationship until after I got out of college. I went for one year, I became a dental assistant and that. And it was kind of weird because all the other times that we would be together, a lot of times we would go to his because he was a he was a partier, um, I didn't drink, I didn't smoke, I didn't cuss. Rodney smoked, and he drank, and he cussed. <laughs> and total, you know, when they say opposites attract, that's definitely what would happen. But used to when we date, you know, nothing really bothered me when other girls talked to him. But after I got out of got done with college, um, I remember we were at a, a party and some other girl was talking to him, and all of a sudden, I, I didn't like it. And so I kind of got, you know, I was a little jealous there. So we got, you know, we're a little bit, got a little bit serious there. I can remember 
My mom always also preached to me. She always wanted me to marry a Baptist boy. Whenever I went on a date, I have to try to work it in the conversation of, you know, what religion were they? And it was always anything but Baptist. Well, Rodney was Catholic. But when I got out of high school, I started to, you know, get a little bit more independent of, you know, I need to do really what's going to make me happy. And um, so we, we, we got married. His mom really didn't care for me because I was Baptist. Um, but we went ahead and we, you know, made it our own life. I guess there was a while there that I thought maybe I could change him. We were, Rodney was the first one out of his group of friends to get married. And uh, here we are, we're honeymooners. And then all of a sudden, all these group of guys come over to our house with, and bring in the beer over here, and they're just wanting to sit there in the living room, drink and drink and drink. And I'm like, gosh darn it, we're newlyweds. So finally I had to say something to Rodney, I'm like, you better get, get these guys to leave. They don't need to come, you know, three times a week over here. So he mentioned something to them, and so they kind of cooled it. The house they were renting, they, did, they went ahead and sold it. So we just thought, well, we'll move out of St. Charles County. We'll, we'll move into, well, I think we moved to Wentzville. So we were a little bit far away that people didn't come visit us that much. So that was good. Rodney, uh, he would drink, you know, occasionally, off and on. Um, I really didn't think of it as a problem. Um, you know, we'd get together with our neighbors or with some friends and play cards and that, so it really wasn't too big of a, a deal. When it finally got to be, I could tell, a problem was when he was, he happened to work at a place that his brother worked at, so whenever it was payday, I didn't know if he was going to be coming home because a lot of times the guys would cash their check and then go to a couple of different bars and then play pool or darts. And by that time, we had two kids and here they are, you know, I got supper ready and then they're going, Mom, where's Dad? Because we're waiting on supper and I'm, I don't know where he's at, you know, taking it out on them. This was before Al-Anon, so I didn't, didn't know what to do. We got in lots of heated arguments. There was times where, I, you know, I just wished that he would, when he was drinking, just drive down there and hit a pole and die. You know, I was just so frustrated. I didn't understand why he was doing that. How come he could, one week, not, you know, come straight home from work, and the next week, be gone all night and have no idea where he's at. Well, we finally had, I think one day I was working and I uh, get a phone call from the sheriff's department and uh, they're asking, they tell me that he had been arrested and could I come over right away? And I'm just like, oh my gosh, what happened? Then it's like, well, how am I going to tell my boss? So I go tell him. I'm like, you know, I, uh, he got arrested. I need to go over to the jail. And it happened to be right across the street. So I'm walking over there. And I go in there, and I'm shaking. And then the police officer, you know, tells me, well, he's been arrested. Do you want to see him? I was so mad and so hurt, I couldn't do it. And I said, no. So then I, I left and I went, went home. And then the kids are asking me where he's at. And I always was a person that I'm not going to lie to my kids. And so then I just told him, you know, he was, he was in jail. And I didn't know how long he was going to be there. Being before Al-Anon, he calls me the next day and he asks me to bail him out. And of course, at my work, I had a 401k. And so what do I do? I cash it in so I can bail them out. Well, then the next year, we're going seeing lawyers and that because then we have to go to trial. 
And I'm just thinking, what am I going to do? I'm, we're living in Troy. It's not that big of a town. People are going to find out. I worked in a dental office. Patients are going to come in. Well, that never did happen. But you know how your mind just keeps on like, oh, this is going to happen. He started going to AA. And then all of a sudden, I remember one day he came home and he said, uh, you need to go to Al-Anon. <laughs> and I'm like, what? I'm not the one with the problem, <laughs> you know? And I'm like, I don't even know what Al-Anon is. And he's like, well, my sponsor said that it's, you know, from, uh, you know, I go, I'm going to AA and you can go to Al-Anon, that'll help you, help you. Fine, I'll go one time. Well, it's been almost 19 years. <laughs> when I uh, first walked in the doors of Al-Anon, I was scared. I, I didn't know what to expect. But I found hope there. There was you know, a group of people there that made me welcome, and I knew that I wasn't alone. We might not have had the same exact stories, but we had that same common factor of alcoholism. I can remember the first three weeks of reading the steps that when it got to my turn, I'm reading them and I guess I could kind of, I could understand what they were talking about that I'd start crying. And then I couldn't finish it and so the person that next to me would just kind of pat me on the back and then they would just continue for me. As Geneva says, um, the group we were going to, there was a, a lady that had founded that group years ago, and she was kind of taking over, every, doing everything for the longest time. And her health had started going downhill. And so I remember Geneva said, you know, we need to all divvy up the responsibility of this group. We need a secretary, a treasurer, we need somebody to take care of the literature, we need a group representative, you know, all this stuff. So everything gets taken, and what's left is group representative. <laughs> so I'm, you know, thinking, well, you know, what does a group representative do? So they're show, you know, told me, well, you're, you represent the group of going to the assemblies, get that information, go into the district meetings, and that, and bring it back to your group. Well, I can do that. That's okay. So that's what I got to be. <laughs> But actually, that was the best thing for me, to hurry up and get into some service work. It was so great to go to the first assembly, a carload of us, to where I didn't have to feel alone, and get the bigger picture of what Al-Anon was. I was so used to just going to my Friday night meeting that, you know, that's all I was thinking of, and then to come to our assembly and then have it the whole state of Missouri, and seeing all these people and know that we have that common denominator, that was a good feeling. After I was the group representative for a while, then as Geneva said, they, we had elections, and um, actually I think the literature coordinator was probably the last thing. It seemed like nobody wanted to do that at first. <laughs> And um, so Geneva and I, we rode together a lot, we roomed together, and so we were sitting next to each other. So I leaned over and I was like, well, what does a literature coordinator do? And she's like, well, they, they have all the books and pamphlets at their house and fill the orders for the groups, you know, and you order more from WSO and all that kind of stuff. Well, my job, I took care of inventory. So I'm thinking, well, I can do that. So what does Geneva do? She takes my elbow and she goes like this. <laughs> and so they're like, oh, Diane. <laughs> so I was uh, elected as the literature coordinator. And that was a really, really fun job, my first area position. Uh, it was really neat to get orders from all these different groups. I'd look on a map to see where they were coming from, fill the order, and send it off to them. It was really, I just really loved it. Um, and then at the convention,
and the assemblies, having the literature table and everything. It was just, it was just wonderful. And it also was at a good time because that was when uh, my husband had gone to prison. He was in for three months. And my, the kids and I, every Sunday, would go ride, fly, drive to Boonville, visit with them. Then I'd go over to my mom and dad's, have supper. Then my mom and dad would watch the kids because it was in the summertime. And then I would go home, and then I would work all week. And it was just the same thing over and over again. And the judge granted that he could get out. And I can remember when I went to pick him up, he's like, I am never going to go to prison again. And I'm thinking, oh, good. So the next five years, you know, he's on probation. We had rules to go by. Um, you know, there couldn't be no drinking at the house. There's just different rules. And I felt kind of on a fine line because in Al-Anon, I'm learning I need to take care of myself and not worry about the alcoholic. But then I've got the legal issues because I didn't want to do anything wrong and have the kids taken away from me. I thought everything was going pretty good until right when the five-year probation was up. And all of a sudden, I remember my son coming up to me. And he's all, he's crying and he's like, Mom, I got to tell you something. I'm like, is it about Dad? And he's like, yeah. OK, well, you know you got to tell me. Well. Dad's got beer out in the, in the garage. And when you come out there, he hurries up and hides it. <sighs> Do you know how hard that is for your son to tell you that your, you know, your husband is sneaking around drinking? You know he's on probation. You know, he's on probation. So then I had to say something to him about, you know, are you going to tell the therapist or, or will I? Because you know I will. So that kind of prolonged things of him being able to stay at the house. Then oh, a little bit later on, I thought things were going pretty good. I was still being continued in my different service positions, DR and alternate public outreach and all these different things. Because I found that when I was kept busy with my service work and going to my meetings, it was making me focus on myself so I could be a better person for me and my kids. And I was fortunate enough that the, the meeting we went to also had Alateen. So then my son and daughter could go to that and learn that it wasn't their fault. What, you know, what their dad did is on him. Well, then I remember one Friday night, my daughter came with me to the meeting. And she was just in there. And all of a sudden, she's like, <laughs> sniffing a little bit, and I'm like, what's wrong? She wouldn't say anything. And I happened to have been chairing the meeting. So I continue on, and she's still, you know, sniffling, and I'm like, Amber, what's wrong? And she's just like, it's Dad. And I'm like, <sighs> and So I asked somebody else to take over chairing so we could go outside. And she shared with me something, and I was just like, devastated. And I was like, OK, so we'll go back in the meeting. And then I talked to somebody in my group, and I was like, you know, I need you guys to come home with me because I'm going to have to have Rodney leave the house. So they came with me, and I told Rod, you know, I had to tell Rodney. I was so mad, and I was like, you need to leave the house now. That I didn't really ever believe in divorce, but I was that close. I was thinking, why is this happening? He's now going to go back to prison. Why, I, do, why do I deserve this? So when we go through the thing again, yes, he did go back to prison. He was there for eight and a half years. But when that happened, I knew that I wasn't alone. I had you guys there to give me the support that I needed. I also had God helping me, too. I knew that to keep the house and everything, I'd probably have to work two jobs. And that's what I did. I worked a full-time job, and I worked a part-time job.
During that time, I also even worked three times to help so that I could keep everything going. I also continued going to Al-Anon meetings and keeping busy in service work. I also knew that my husband was a good person. When he wasn't drinking, he was a very good, caring person. I know his family, I remember one of his sisters told me, Diane, I wouldn't blame you if you wanted to get a divorce. And I was like, you know what, I love him, and I know that there's a good person, he just needs help. So when he was uh, in prison a while, I would visit him every two weeks, and we'd talk on the phone. And then when he had to go to Farmington, I was like, that's a pretty long drive. I'm only going to come once a month. And we would write to each other, and we would talk on the phones. But I needed to keep myself, I needed to keep myself busy, and I needed to work on myself of being as good as I could be, and as happy. I deserved to be happy. And I knew that he was in the right place to get the help that he needed. And over the time, I could see that. When we would visit, we would, and then on the phone, and even in letters, he was really writing down his deep feelings, and then I could do the same thing. For the longest time, when we get mad and that, we didn't have very good communication. We would just not say anything. And you can't solve anything when, you can't talk, when you're not talking. So... You know, the good thing that came out of that was that we learned how to communicate and to respect each other. While, uh, well, while I was working two jobs, there was one night, well, one day that my uh, daughter was at home, and uh, I remember she asked if she could, she could go out with her friends, and I told her no. You know, that she, she had got grounded for something. She was my straight-A student, and she did something that I grounded her for. And I said, you have to wait till you're ungrounded. And, you know, I got to go to work. So I go to work, my part-time job. I come home a little after 10. Her car isn't there. And I'm like, girl, you are in trouble. About 10 minutes after that, I get a knock on the door, and it's a police officer. I never would have thought a police officer was going to come about my daughter. I figured it'd either be my husband or my son. The police officer was holding Amber's wallet. And she's like, are you Mrs. Stahlschmidt? I'm like, yes. Is your daughter Amber? Yes. Well, she's been involved in an accident. I'm like, OK. She goes, uh, because she was 16 and she was unconscious, they needed to fly her to St. John's Mercy. I'm like, okay. She goes, do, I need, do you want me to help you call anybody? I'm like, no, I got it. I, I, I'll take care of it. So I still was composed, and I thought, okay, I need to call my mom and dad. I tried calling my mom and dad, and for some reason they're, they're phone wasn't working right, so I thought, you know what, I'll just go ahead and drive myself. It's probably just some bumps and bruises. So I drive down there, saying the serenity prayer. I get in there, and I'm waiting, and then finally somebody comes and gets me, and uh, they bring me in there to, to one, you know, because she was unconscious, they needed me to identify her. And I can remember walking in there and I could see her fingernail polish. And I was like, yep, that's her. She um, had hit some black ice on the road and then hits the one tree on the road and it damaged her brain stem so that way she couldn't breathe on her own. Then she also ruptured her spleen so they needed to get in there and do surgery. So they needed my permission, so I said yes. So then they go do that, and I'm going, I'm in the waiting room, and here's this lady comes up to me, and I didn't even look at her tag while well, she was a, a chaplain. And she's like, um, is there anybody we can, you know, contact that? And I'm like, 
You know what? My son just left this morning to he was in the Marines. He just left back to San Diego. My husband's in prison. I said, you know what I need to do? I need to call my sponsor. So that's what she did. They called the Red Cross to track down my son. They got hold of my sponsor. And I told her that Amber was in a bad accident. And so could she let people know? So then during the night after Amber was done with her surgery, they had to still see if she was going to make it because she still wasn't breathing on her own. I can remember when I came out of the room all of my Rodney's family was there, my mom and dad, my sponsor, and other Al-Anon members. It helped me to get through that time of having you guys there for me. By the late morning, the doctors checked to see if she could breathe on her own, and that she could. So there was nothing that they could do. So I told them that I wanted whatever they could use to, to uh, transplant, that they could do that. So somebody has one of her kidneys, somebody has her eye lens, and somebody else has something else. There was three things. And then I know Rodney's mom, I think, and one of his sisters and brother had to go to the prison to let him know what happened. At first, he thought something happened to me since I wasn't there. But then when they told him that Amber had died, I know that had to be really hard for him. It was really hard to do the memorial net because he wasn't allowed to leave. He, he had to deal with that all on his own. I can remember when I was at the church, sitting on the steps waiting for people to show up, for the memorial, and my, I was keeping, you know, a really positive outlook on this. Of you know, I can remember, I can remember we we're at the funeral home. There were so many kids that came from the high school, and one, one girl came up to me and she said, "I am so mad at God for taking Amber away from us." And I was like, "Why are you mad at God? He didn't take her away." That's just life. Things happen. And I know that I will see her again. So hopefully that might have planted a little seed in that person to not be mad at God. That was really hard. But that was one of the, one of the life's things that I was so grateful to have Al-Anon and my higher power with me to get through stuff. And I also, when I'd be working, the different jobs I had, you know, you're laughing, and, and then when I would share about, you know, that Anna Amber, Amber had died, and they're just like, gosh, how can you be so happy? And I'm like, well, God wants me to be happy. He wants me to enjoy my life. Sure, bad things happen. I could be down in the dumps and then have a miserable life or I can enjoy it and show other people that there's help out there to get you the support and to handle things. Well, finally, my uh, husband got, got out. And um, I remember right before he, he got out of the prison, I told him, I was like, OK, there's going to be some, I don't want to say rules, but there's some guidelines here of that. Uh, 
you're going to do what you're supposed to do on parole. You're going to get a job right away, and I don't care if it's flipping hamburgers. And we're going to try to get the, make this work. And actually, it's been really super. We've, we've both learned how to communicate and enjoy life and also comfort each other during our sorrows. I wanted to read something here out of our One Day at a Time. It says, what we get from our association with Al-Anon depends pretty much on what we put into it. Certainly the Al-Anon program can help me rid myself of my despairs and frustrations. But the major effect of listening, observing, and concentrating must be mine. Al-Anon points the way, but we must take the road. Al-Anon provides the tools, but we must use them. I really like that. It reminds me of my last job that I had. I worked in a factory. <laughs> we printed Harley Davidson apparel. Almost all the guys had tattoos all over them, and I wasn't used to that. There was even girls that had tattoos. And then, um, anyway, I started off on first shift, and then they asked for volunteers to go to second, and so I did. And this was just before Rodney had gotten out of prison. And I really liked it. And I guess because of all the jobs I've had, I um, can be kind of a leader. And I like my surroundings to be positive. And so, you know, um, over time, the supervisor on second shift, I guess, saw that quality in me and asked, said that um, she would like me to be the line lead. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I'm in charge of a lot of people. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, I'll try it. Well, I was just being me. Um, I wanted people to start off the day on a good note, and so I used the different slogans. So it happened to be on a Monday, and I'd be saying hi to everybody on my side, and I would find out what they're doing, make sure they're all set, and then I'd say, um, let's see, I'm trying to think of one. Keep it important, you know, how important is it? And so they're like, oh, that's kind of, that's, I can use that, especially if somebody was struggling. So then, Oh, a week later, somebody's like, hey, Diane, do you got another little saying you want to do? And I'm like, just for today. <laughs> so then, so, you know, I'm, I'm saying all these different things. So it got to be a routine of every Monday was a new slogan. <laughs> um, well, my supervisor kind of found that out. And when, whenever it was our evaluation time, you had to make goals. And so anyway, she's like... Um, uh, everybody likes working on your side of the line. She goes, um, you know, what kind of goals do you want to set? I'm like, well, I can, you know, how about, um, you know, oh, she was like bringing up the morale. That's what it was, because before people were always kind of always in the dumps and everything, and I wanted, you know, so she could tell the morale was starting to boost a little bit on second shift. So anyway, I'd say within three months, I... She could check off that goal. Um, I would do Magnificent Monday, It's Terrific Tuesday, Wonderful Wednesday, Thrilling Thursday, and Fantastic Friday. Yeah. And you know, it sounded kind of corny, but you know what? It helped. It helped set our day off, and everybody really looked forward to it. If I and then they got it to what I tell you, it was really demanding. It was, it was like I'd have these sayings, and I'd say, okay, these are good for a month, okay? And then it's like every week they wanted me to come up with something new, and I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> but it was a good feeling to know that it was, that they appreciated, you know, that I was uh, my positive outlook on things. And over the four, five years I worked there, you know, I would, um, Depending on the conversation, I would share 
um, different events that had happened, you know, like, you know, with Rodney being in prison, uh, losing Amber, you know, just different things like that, it, there was a couple of girls that would come to me afterwards, and they're just like, you know, if you can do it, Diana, I can. And I would just point them in the right direction. And I told, and they always knew they could come and talk to me. Well, the I try to think the last year that I was working, uh, I got a phone call from my dad, and he was being admitted in the hospital because he had been losing weight a lot, and his back was hurting. And every doctor they went to, they couldn't really figure out what was wrong, and uh, finally they found out that he had prostate cancer. And it had gone too far. It was already in the bones. And I knew that wasn't good, but then in a way I was kind of trying to put it aside. So, you know, I'm taking dad to his doctor's appointments for chemotherapy and some, you know, they'd start a drug and that would work good for a while. Then it would stop working so they'd have to start another one. I was really close to my dad real close. I was his little girl. And in the meantime, my mom, memory was going. So she was showing signs of dementia. So I told dad, you know, I'd help as much as I could. I even was working just half shifts. I went to my supervisor and I said I need to be there for my mom and dad. And they were like, you go ahead, you can do that. So I really miss my dad. I can remember when we took him to go with, get chemo and they did blood work. And then they said, we're not going to do, do it today. And so um, my dad, you know, he wasn't dumb. He's like, how much do, what time do I got? And they're like, uh, three months. Okay. And the, I remember the doctor looked at me and I think he mouthed, like, call me. So I take dad home and, and he's like, okay, you know, when I die, put your mom in a nursing home. And I'm just like, dad, I go, mom's not that bad. She doesn't need to go in a nursing home. You know, I'll take care of her. And at that. I don't know what it was, but that was on a Friday, and my dad died that following Thursday. But there again, you all were there for me to get me through it. Now I'm caring for my mom, who suffers from Alzheimer's. And it's not easy. We eventually, I was going back and forth between my mom's house and our house, and we just decided to sell our house and move in with her so that way she could still be in familiar surroundings. And we have our good days and we have our bad. I am so thankful for our slogans and the serenity prayer. I love my mom, but I guess we're both alike a little bit. And when I look at my mom, I'm seeing the mom that I grew up as a kid, and that's not her. Yes, she still recognizes me in that, but there's a lot of times when she gets up in the morning, she looks around, confused, and I'll say, what's wrong, Mom? She's like, well, where am I? I go, well, you're in your home. And after a while, I just kind of figured out, why did she say that? And then all of a sudden, I remembered, you know what? They lived in St. Charles for 30 years, so when she thinks of home, she's thinking of that home. She's not thinking of the home in Winfield. So uh, I know that coming to al -Anon, that I need to take care of myself. So I have a caregiver come out twice a week for a few hours so that I can get a break from my mom and she can get a break from me work out at the gym, run errands. I got to take care of myself before I can help anybody else. So we're just taking one day at a time until when it gets to a point where I know that I can't 
care for her the properly, then we'll go from there. I appreciate you all coming here and listening to my story. I hope that it has shed some light on some some people that how Alan and really can help you get through things. When I first started coming to Alan on, I grabbed onto the slogan one day at a time. And then over time, you know, then the other ones came in handy. And like I said, when I was working at the factory using all those slogans, yeah, I was using that to boost everybody else's morale, but it was also boosting my morale too, helping me to get through today, that's all we can worry about. Yesterday's gone, can't worry about tomorrow. I just want to thank all, everybody here, and I really liked how the heading for this, for this conference was Let It Begin With Us, because on my license plate, it's an acronym, Let It Begin With Me. Thank you.